Karen Knightley strikes me as one of those unassuming actresses. She has an impressive filmography dating back to the mid-90s, but is like one of those actresses that takes on a role, does it well, and then retreats from the spotlight. A lot of this probably has to do with how much disdain she suffered early in her career. As Megan Connor wrote in The Guardian, Keira Knightley, quote, appears to have attracted an extraordinary amount of vitriol in her short career. If she's not too pretty to be worthy of her success, she is too posh, too thin. If there is a more valid reason why she gets under people's skin, they often struggle to articulate it, end quote, and that, quote, the more successful Knightley has become in Hollywood, it seems, the more irritating she has become to the public, end quote. It's weird to consider how much people disliked her, especially when she's one of those celebrities that has pretty much done nothing wrong. No one can point at Karen Knightley and say that she did something evil or terrible. She seems to be, for all intents and purposes, insofar as one can glean from the outside, a fine person. Slightly less important than being a decent person, she's also an excellent actress. Kiera Knightley, who amusingly was supposed to be named Kiera Knightley, but was misnamed after her mother accidentally put the E before the I, was pretty much destined to go into show business. Both of her parents were actors, though neither were particularly successful. She got her start, as so many do, with TV, though mostly doing TV films and appearing on one-off episodes as opposed to doing season runs. 1995's Innocent Lives was her film debut, but it's safe to say the 1999 Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, was the most important role of the 90s for her. Alas, her name came back to bite her on the movie. She was credited as Kiera Knightley, not Kiera Knightley. She played Padme Amidala's handmaiden and decoy and looked so much like Natalie Portman that when the two were in makeup, even their mothers had difficulty telling them apart. She had no movies in 2000, after which she had at least one movie every year for the next 21 years, eventually clocking more than 40 films so far. Now you're bound to have more than a couple of duds when you've done so many roles, but one thing is undeniable. Keira Knightley is a working woman's actress. She gets the role, executes it, then moves on to the next one. She started off doing supporting roles in movies like The Hole in 2001 and Thunderpants in 2002, but quickly began landing lead or co-lead roles. She was in a TV adaptation of Dr. Zhivago, which got solid reviews, though, of course, was found lacking against David Lean's 1965 masterpiece. It was 2003's Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, that put Knightley on the map and rocketed her to superstardom when she was just 18. Not only was the movie a critical and commercial success, it is, just as importantly, one of the funnest films ever made. I found it impossible not to have a good time when watching the first three Pirates movies, and Knightley is certainly a part of that. Though Johnny Depp's Jack Sparrow is the star of the show, Knightley's Elizabeth Swan is no slouch and over the course of three films develops into something of a pirate herself. She would reprise the role two more times as part of the main cast and return at the end of Dead Men Tell No Tales. It's not for nothing that the movies really started to suffer after she left. She and Orlando Bloom's Paul Turner help round out the movies. Her next movie, Love Actually, was also a success though she was part of an ensemble cast. 2004's King Arthur was a commercial hit, and it was also one of the first of the kinds of movies that Knightley would become increasingly famous for, period pieces. There she played Guinevere, and won particular praise for how she threw herself into the role. 2005 was a landmark year for her. She starred in Joe Wright's adaptation of Pride and Prejudice, based on Jane Austen's novel of the same name. The movie was a critical and commercial hit, and won Knightley a nomination for Best Actress at the Academy Awards for her portrayal of Elizabeth Bennet. In the same year, she played Domino Harvey, an actual bounty hunter, though the movie was lambasted critically and at the box office. 2006 and 2007 saw the releases of Dead Man's Chest and, at World's End, her final main appearances in the Pirates of the Caribbean series. Both were massive successes. 2007 also saw her reunite with Pride and Prejudice director Joe Wright for Atonement, hailed as one of the best movies of the 2000s. The movie saw Knightley in a green dress, which has its own Wikipedia page. Designed by Jacqueline Duran, herself a winner of two Academy Awards, the dress is considered one of the most beautiful pieces of film fashion. 2008's The Duchess was another period drama, which saw Knightley play Georgina Cavendish, Duchess of Devonshire, an ancestor of Princess Diana, whose lives have often been compared for their tragedy. Real life aside, Knightley, as always, won praise for her role. The Duchess and the two small films before it represented a new path for Knightley. She pretty much stopped doing big budget films and focused on doing indie movies. 
2011's A Dangerous Method, directed by David Cronenberg, was well-reviewed and hailed as one of the year's best films. It took a look at the relationship between psychologists Carl Jung, Sigmund Freud, and Sabina Spiorain, portrayed by Knightley, a colleague of both figures. 2012's Seeking a Friend for the End of the World is like a lot of Knightley's films. It got mixed reviews, didn't make much money, and got praise for Knightley's performance. However mixed a film's overall reception might be, Knightley is rarely, if ever, the issue. She's one of those actresses that gives every role her all. In 2012, she was in Anna Karenina, based on Leo Tolstoy's novel. For the movie, she reunited with Jacqueline Duran for the costuming, and the movie won Duran an Oscar. 2013's Begin Again was a critical and commercial hit, while 2014's Jack Ryan was a commercial success. One of her biggest postpart successes came in 2014, where she starred alongside Benedict Cumberbatch in The Imitation Game, a film based on the life of eminent codebreaker and computer scientist Alan Turing. A year later, she was in 2014's Everest, based on the 1996 Mount Everest disaster. Both films were box office hits and critical successes. In 2018, she was in Colette, a biographical film about Colette, author of the 1944 novella Gigi, which would later be turned into a musical film that won an Academy Award for Best Picture in the 1950s. 2018's The Nutcracker and the Four Realms has been her only post-parts movie that had a budget of greater than $100 million, though the movie got negative reviews and flopped at the box office. In 2019, she starred in Official Secrets, where she plays real-life whistleblower Catherine Gunn, and the film got solid reviews. 2020's Misbehavior and 2021's Charlotte, an animated film, both got solid reviews though, as indie films, like so many of Knightley's movies, did not make much money. Her most recent movie was 2023's Boston Strangler, where she plays Loretta McLaughlin, the reporter who broke the story about the Strangler in the 1960s. Knightley has several roles in the works and seems to be preparing to return to the small screen with Black Doves for Netflix. If there's one thing we can probably expect from Kara Knightley, it's a great performance. She's yet to disappoint, and should Disney ever decide to re-up Pirates of the Caribbean, please pay her whatever she wants to come back.